Hey, just one second, Elder Baldwin. I'm sorry. That's okay. Wait just a second. This is, this is all new to me. So <laughs> no okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, thanking you and praising you for this opportunity to come and gather together for wise counsel. And Lord, bless this meeting today. Give us wisdom, give us sensitivity, give us insight and foresight so we may do a good work for thee. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Uh, praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, those of you who are joining us on uh, Facebook Live, uh, we greet you in the name of Jesus. Uh, my name is Sister Ariana Anderson, and uh, we are excited to have you all uh, joining us this evening for our second edition of Millennials, the Church, and COVID-19. Um, as you can see, our panelists look a little bit different from last week. We tried to mix it up just a little bit so that we give you all um, a brighter, a broader range, uh, a broader range of perspectives this time around. Um, and hopefully we'll just be able to continue on in this great discussion. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce um, all of our panelists here, and then we're going to go ahead and start off with the discussion. Thank you all for being so patient with us um, as we have uh, been trying to get um, ourselves going with our live and with our Zoom conferences. Uh, we greet you and we, and we first give honor to our bishop and our first lady, um, Suffragan Bishop C. Sean Tyson and first lady Krista Tyson. We honor them on this evening uh, for allowing us to have this space and this moment to communicate with all of you. Uh, first, we have a uh, sister or auntie, uh, Lynn Brantley. Um, we're so excited to have you joining us here from Youngstown, Ohio, a part of Mount Calvary. Um, and we are excited and we're blessed that you're here with us this evening. If you have just brief words of a hello, if you will, um, to the people really quickly. Hello, and thank you for having me. <laughs> Of course, of course. Um, next, we have a uh, brother, my brother, uh, Brandon Jones, who is out of Christ Church Apostolic and now uh, moving on to Maryland uh, here very shortly as he is getting ready to uh, get married and we're excited for him and we're excited to have you um, on this panel discussion again this evening. So God bless you tonight, Brother Brandon. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> Uh, next, we have joining us um, Elder Baldwin here from Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, we are so excited to have you here, Elder Baldwin, joining us into this uh, discussion. Good evening, everybody. I'm excited about being here, and I am humbled to even have this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, next on the panel discussion, um, if you were on last week's discussion, you uh, saw him, uh, Dr. Rayvon Key, who is a clinical psychologist, and he had some amazing uh, points to give us on last week. So we're just excited to have you back here joining us again, Dr. Key. Hey, everybody. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> we're glad to have you back. Um, also joining us on this evening, we have Pastor Bruce uh, Hardin, who is the founding pastor of One to Another Evangelistic Ministries in Pula, Georgia. So we're very excited to have you here uh, this evening, Pastor Hardin. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And last but certainly not least, uh, my newest friend, uh, Brittany Brantley here out of Youngstown, Ohio, who is an attorney, um, as well as just an avid committed servant um, in Mount Calvary. It's been amazing. The short time that I've been here to watch her lend herself uh, to the house of God has been amazing. So we're definitely grateful to have you back on this uh, panel discussion as well. That was high praise. Uh, praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> it's, it's good to, to be back on this panel and uh, Ariana, I appreciate you for that praise and I'm looking forward to the questions that you throw out at us today. Hey Amen. Uh, we're just going to jump right on into these questions. Um, for those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live, uh, we are going to uh, allow for a couple minutes uh, for Q&A at the end of our panel discussion. So please 
uh, type your comments, type your questions into the uh, question box, and we will make sure that we uh, try to get to them to the best of our ability. And we thank you guys again uh, for joining us. So our first question, we're just going to jump right in. Um, so on today's panel, unlike last week, we had um, mostly and totally all millennials joining us. And so on this panel discussion for today, uh, we have millennials, those who were born between 1981 and 96. We had to make sure that we made that clarification uh, last week. The millennials uh, are not 18, they're not 17, they're not 15, but they are between 24 and 39. Uh, we also have members on this panel from Generation X. So uh, those who were born between 1965 and 1980. And uh, we have baby boomers on this panel. So those who were born between 46 and 64. Um, we spoke last week about how this pandemic has affected millennials financially, psychologically, and spiritually. Uh, for our panelists who are a part of Generation X or who are baby boomers, um, could you share with us how this pandemic has affected you personally and what you may be experiencing during this time that is different um, from what some of the concerns that millennials have expressed um, on last week's panel? So I'll let, I'll throw that out there and see who wants to jump in at first. Pastor Hardin, would you like to get sure, in? Sure, no problem. Okay. Being a part of the baby boomers, um, I have not really noticed a whole lot of difference from my perspective. I've seen a lot of different activities. As Dr. Key said earlier, I'm in Georgia and in Georgia, we opened up very early and people are acting like nothing's going on. But the biggest thing that I've noticed is that the younger generation doesn't seem to be afraid as the older people are. Uh, my generation, we are a little more skeptical. We are a little more hesitant to go out. We're a little more hesitant to, <laughs> to even, I guess you could say, intermingle with family members. I know some people that won't even let their kids come over. Um, so the generation X, we tend to be a little more safe, a little more rule oriented. And so it's affected us in that way that we don't have the fellowship like we did personally before the pandemic came. Okay, so what I'm hearing is some of the younger people may be a little bit more uh, fearless when it comes to dealing with this uh, pandemic right now. And, and rightfully and rightfully so, because I think there was some miscommunication that kind of came out at the beginning of the pandemic, right? That said that mostly people who were older or uh, who are children were most susceptible to the disease. So a lot of young people may have taken that risk thinking that they could not have been affected. Um, and now we definitely see that that is, that is not the case. Uh, there are 20 year olds, there are, are, are 18 year olds who are being affected, um, affected by this disease. So I definitely see that perspective. Um, anyone else want to add to how this pandemic is affecting you personally and differently than it is from uh, other young people or other millennials? Um, I can say that in living uh, the way my husband and I are now as retirees, we're basically, we're home a lot and then sometimes we're not. Uh, we are travelers. So that has really, really shut us down. Um, I have grandchildren who are in Georgia that I'm not able to see. I have some that are in Pittsburgh that I'm not able to see. So that, that part has affected me um, the things that I do weekly, I go and I visit those who cannot get out. So because the nursing homes and, you know, those homes are, are shut down, you can't really get to them. So you have to kind of come up with um, different ways and means to reach out to them. Um, my main thing is I go to the gym every day. So that truly wiped me out. Um, and it became a mental thing. I'm like, oh my God, I can't, I can't go to the gym. So um, I think the other generations would be more affected because of work. Um, I have children who can work remotely and I have some that actually had to go in. So that's affected them. Then I have the grandchildren who now need to be taught by their parents who are at home. So that's different for them. You know, I'm not going through that. And then their social lives, they have them. 
where I don't really have all of that. But so I think those are some of the differences that I'm seeing. I appreciate that perspective. So we're talking about maybe a difference in uh, financial concern. I know last uh, last week's discussion, we were talking about how millennials are in transition. Uh, they're starting to start families, buy houses and different things like that. Uh, whereas you mentioned you're retired, you're kind of settled into those things. So some of those worries you don't have um, as much as some of the millennials do. Um, I'm gonna jump, If uh, Elder Baldwin, did you wanna jump in on this question as well? Yep. All the baby boomers aren't retired. <laughs> Just going to put that out there. Um, I'm still working. And how it affected me is um, I work with a lot of millennials. And so I had to redesign how I work. Um, I'm working remotely. And sometimes I have to go to different sites because, you know, the saying goes when the uh, Cats away, sometimes the mice still play. So just showing up helps keep things running. But it made me, uh, like on one of your questions there, really take uh, note of where I am on this end of the journey and really appreciate the things that I've had in my life, but still look at what I want to do to stay purposeful and stay in the game. Um, so for me as a baby boomer, I'm, I'm assessing what contributions I can still make. You know, how am I impacting my part while I'm here on earth? And mortality, I think that's what the COVID condition has brought that mortality is real. It's not something we heard about, you know? So that's my two cents. I appreciate that perspective. We're talking about uh, learning how to shift um, from working uh, in a place versus having to work remotely. Maybe there's a, a learning curve with having to do uh, certain things um, via technology now, via Skype, via Zoom, um, uh, whereas before we didn't have to do that. And also the concern of health and mortality is a very real one. So I definitely appreciate that perspective. Um, I'm going to jump on to the next question, and um, this is something that I think all of us can answer. Um, from your perspective, how has church culture positively shifted throughout your lifetime, and how has it negatively shifted? So when we're talking about church culture, uh, we're talking about the way we run services, the way we do outreach, maybe the number of services, the standards, the restrictions. What changes have you seen? I know for myself, um, even though I'm only 25, I'll be 26 in two weeks, amen. Uh, but even though I'm only 25, um, when I was a kid, I remember that there were way more services uh, when I was younger. I remember going to more services. Um, I remember, you know, uh, there being a stricter dress code. Like I was not allowed to go into the service with a pair of pants on. Mother Bond, my grandmother would not allow it. It's not a thing. Whereas now it's normal to watch other services and you see uh, young women in different attire. Um, I think the whole dynamic of church has kind of shifted. So throughout all of your lifetimes, what have you seen that has been a positive shift and what do you think has been a negative shift? Um, I'm gonna jump to some of the, the millennials first and then we're just gonna kind of ping pong around. So maybe Dr. Key, if you wanna take this question first. Uh, yeah, this is a, um, it's a pretty uh, loaded question, a pretty complex question, I think. And, you know, me being 40, you know, and kind of in that gap, <laughs> I think I have a perspective that, um, you know, is, is, is pretty broad. The church that I belong to and that I was raised in was, um, was started by a woman who was born in 1900. Okay. She was born in 1900. She started the church at age 55. So when I was born, she was well in, like, she was around 80 and wasn't even preaching anymore by the time I was born. You know, so, you know, I came up in that time where we had multiple services on Sunday, you know, you had a uh, Bible study, you had evangelistic service, you had choir rehearsal, you were in church five, 
six times a week, you know? And then as um, she aged, she passed at 93, her granddaughter took over the church who happened to be 39 at the time. <laughs> so I'm a 13 year, 14 year old when she passes. And, you know, we begin to see the evolution of the church from somebody who was actually a baby boomer. I don't even know what you would call somebody born in 1900, but my pastor, <laughs> my pastor was a baby, uh, a baby boomer. You know, and even with her in leadership, we saw the change taking place because there was a lot more consideration given to the changing times, a lot more consideration given to the fact that um, young people, younger people were going to college and going to school. Um, a lot of consideration was given to the fact that people were no longer working nine to fives from Monday through Friday, but they were taking jobs that had them working on Saturdays and Sundays as well because things were open seven days a week, you know? So what we saw was that the services got shorter. I remember under the, the first pastor, we literally had a, a prayer service on Sunday morning where people got down on their knees and we didn't get up until she started singing. So it could have been a long time. When, the, when, when my current pastor took over, that stopped. The testimony services dwindled down a little bit and services became more compact and concentrated and, uh, uh, and they flowed and they were shorter, you know? And even now, um, during the pandemic, having to deal with that, we've been able to uh, put an entire service into less than an hour less than an hour's time and thinking about where I came from and the type of services we were having before the pandemic, I could never imagine all of what we do being able to be finished in an hour's time, but we're proving that it can be done. So what I'm seeing is a lot of streamlining is what I'm seeing over time um, because of changes in leadership and also uh, things like pandemics happening that cause us to kind of rethink how we do church. Um, so, and if I may, oh, yeah, jump in, Randy, please. Um, so if I may, I, I think I can piggyback off of what Dr. Key is saying. Um, over my time, and um, I'm 35, um, and I'll be 36 coming up in August. But um, over my time, I've I've seen a couple of generations. Of, uh, if 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 you really think about it, a couple of generations. There's the church from my younger younger days, um, which was still um strict <laughs> very very strict um and there was three services on sunday morning and there was a there was a meeting every night and church was their whole life and there's nothing and there's nothing wrong with that um i think what we have to understand is during these different generations the saints did what what they had to do to get by and even and you can even translate that to our present day church we're having church online because this is the circumstances that presents itself to us and so we're doing what we have to do by uh, have to do to get by but i um in the elevation of the church over over the years um education has played a big part um i remember old mothers uh and, and elders and deacons who didn't know Greek and Hebrew, but they knew how to reach the throne. They knew that there was power in the name of Jesus. All they knew was calling on the name of Jesus and they would they would feel something. Now with, with us as an older generation, we 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 ask more questions. Um, I, I've also I've noticed that um, you can you can tell things in dialect from uh, from the older saints. Older saints will tell you something to the effect of, well, Bishop such and such taught us this, or they will say, well, we were taught at this, but our, our younger generation, we care more about, well, the Bible teaches us. We, we want to have, so we, we're, we're asking you to back that up with scripture. Well, where, where is this found? Well, why do we do this? Well, is it found scripturally? Um, so those are changes that I think have happened over time uh, with the different generations. Education plays a big part in it. Um, the advancement of technology, how we present streamlining services. We, we found out that this drags, this takes a long time. What purpose does this really serve? Having somebody, having the MC come up all the time. And next we're gonna have such and such and such get up and say two words 
And then next we're gonna have, and we, we've kind of streamlined that now to where the services flows. Some changes needed to be present, but also sometimes even as a millennial, I long for things in the older church. Some of those aspect, uh, aspects of that church are missed. I'm sorry, I said a whole mouthful, but th those, are, those are changes that I've seen. And, and I would like to, and I would like to say that as a result, I see, you know, the, the baby boomers and Generation X as a lot more disciplined in their Christianity. They, they, team, they seem to be more disciplined Christians versus uh, this millennial generation that, that tends to be more critical thinkers. You know, it, we ask questions. We want to know why, you know, it can't just be because I said so, you know, but we lose a little bit in that process we, we we lose a little bit of our of our uh you know of our conviction and our faith and you know and, and we can't stand you know some of the tests that our, our our uh forefathers stood because of that because we always have to know know something instead of just being able to believe something so that's where i would say are the disadvantages and advantages you know over time and I'll jump in to, to piggyback off of both Dr. Key and Brandon. Um, someone said last week, I can't remember that we have mastered Sunday mornings. And I think we can go even further than that. I think it was truer that we were even better masters of Sunday morning back in the day. And not just Sunday morning, but Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays in the context of the church. So I think, you know, what we lacked at that time was more development of well-rounded people and making whole families because we spent so much time in the church and I'm old enough to where I was in the church a lot. Um, so we spent so much time within the confines of the church and we were centered around church that in a way we didn't focus on families. Um, as far as restrictions, we have relaxed on those standards and restrictions to a certain extent. There more, there's more liberty and flexibility for people to run their own households, where back in the day, you know, we asked the pastor before we made any move. Um, and so I think on the flip side of that, the, the, we see a shift in culture now where everybody's sort of on an island. So, you know, it, it's rare that a, a pastor or a leader will step into everyone's household because they've got their own households to run. So I think that, you know, as a church and collective church, not just one church, I think we can stand to be a little bit more involved in the family development because a lot of people, you know, didn't grow up seeing healthy relationships um, in their own households. So I, I can see that there has to be a balance, you know, no, I don't want to, I have no interest in, in running your household, but there are things that may have helped me in my marriage or, or raising my children, um, those things that could be helpful to, to other people who had no really good experience in that. So I think that those are some things that we can marry um, together for both of those times and those generations. Wow, I enjoyed those comments. So we're talking about maybe involvement has shifted involvement of leadership into the everyday lives of, of some of the, of the parishioners. We're talking about consolidating and condensing services to figure out what works, what doesn't, what's necessary. And we're talking about uh, the age of asking why. Um, um, we're a lot more inquisitive and, and we wanna ask a lot more questions. So I appreciate these comments. Um, Pastor Hardin, did you wanna um, add something really quickly? Yes, um, one of the things that I love and I've seen the church progress in is kind of what uh, Brother Brandon said and Dr. Uh, Key, the questioning, the critical thinking, and I'm a thinker. And so I even today challenge the church to think, look at scripture and think, you know, don't just accept Adam and Eve did, did this think about it. So I really love that. Also, when we came along into the holiness movement, children weren't allowed to do certain things. Or if you didn't weren't born again, you weren't allowed to do certain things. But there's an inclusiveness today in churches what allows certain people to come and participate, which gives them a sense of belonging, a sense of a part of the family. Um, and the but the thing that I missed the most, and I think that's been the most negative from my perspective is the altar seems to be gone. Uh, and when I mean the altar seems to be gone, the sacrifice 
of us at the altar sacrificing our lives for, for the sake of the gospel. In other words, allowing the Lord to come in and let us stop at the altar before we proceed out into the world in our Christian life. Uh, many churches, you can come in and you just do bypassing the altar. And where the altar, what I think brings in back to the discipline that Dr. Key was saying, the discipline that we had, we learned a lot of it from laying around the altar and being at the altar um, in the presence of God from that perspective. And I, I missed that. And I think that's a negative to some degree. Now I'll ask a question with your, with your response. When you're talking about the altar, are you talking about like prayer services and things of that nature? To, yes, to, to a degree. Now not the, oh, let's lay at the, oh, we're praying all night. But the actual part where it's expected of you to spend time in prayer with God um, collectively, and I, I can remember, I think I hear Brother Brandon said that you don't, you did, the lady, uh, that was Dr. Keith, would pray until she sang, not that perspective, but the place at the altar where your heart was rendered to God. And so it's not the physical aspect of it, but the mental aspect of it, if I, if I would be clear in saying what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can uh, I, Baldwin, did you want to jump in as well? Yes, uh, Pastor Harding, he uh, have a note written down. Uh, and I appreciate what Brandon and uh, Dr. Key and baby, my baby, uh, Brittany, you know, when you look at, and, and my sister Lynn, she, Lynn was already in the church when God saved me. So I was at that brink, I think Lynn would agree with me, when there was change with our bishop. I was, I was in that group that, to start asking questions. And questions were sometimes perceived as being rebellious. And but one of the things that I am most grateful for our pastor and the saints that were around was that altar impact on our lives. And what's missing, I feel, heaven is not on the table now. You know, we talk about what God can do for us. We talk about what we can get from it or what it can save us from, but it doesn't tell us where we're going to. And that's the part of the church that I was baptized in and like being at that altar and knowing this is the place where I met Jesus. I met the changing factor to say, I don't want to live like I used to live. And there's a God that I experience now. And I experience and get a greater experience from inclusion. I'm, I'm a part of a family. I'm a part of young people. I'm a part of old people. I'm a part. That's what I miss. I'm so sorry. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in um, on this. I want to go back to Brother Brandon, Dr. Key, Brittany, um, with something that was said. We, as baby boomers, in the atmosphere that I grew up in, we didn't question, we were not really permitted mm -hmm. to really ask a whole lot of questions. And as Chuck said, if we did, you could kind of come off as rebellious. So now there's a problem. But what we did was we did what we were told. We had a list of do's and don'ts. And we did it. And it was kind of looking like blind obedience, which isn't always good. 
but that's how we were raised for a period in there. But Bishop Wagner, who pastored for 40 years, he taught us once he got in there and people say it, he was before his time and he really, really was. So he ran up against some walls and he didn't because we were following him. You know, we were running up against it. And what I wanna say is he taught us, not only us, we were a little older, but our children through our educational system that our church had to think. He told them, do not be intimidated. He taught them to ask questions. He let them know that we would have, you know, the calls, the secular calls to however world, however he put that. Um, our whole world was basically the church. We got out of school, we went to church. Um, we were in church, church, church so much until it was unreal to me. Even in raising my kids, we were in church all day Sunday, get out at 1130 at night. They're torn up on Monday trying to go to school. We're dragging them to school, trying, trying to get all of that done. And it was a lot. Then once they recovered on Monday, we were back on Tuesday and we were there all night. And it was just a lot. But what I'm saying is our whole world was the church, but our children were not raised that way. They still have a relationship with God. It didn't look like ours. So, but that didn't mean they were not saved. We had a different look to the same Holy Ghost and to the same holiness. So their global is two different mindsets. Our kids are all over the place doing some of everything filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and loving God, but looking a little different than we look and it's okay. So I just wanted to say, even though we didn't ask questions and we followed along, we were blessed enough to have um, a great leader. And if I had to do it all over again, I'd probably do most of it the same way because it made me who I am and me able to raise that, that God blessed me with to be who they are. So I just wanted to kind of come back with the thinking part and, and following blindly and the asking questions and to how that went and why it was. I definitely appreciate all these, ex, um, these explanations and these answers. If you all are enjoying this conversation via Facebook Live, uh, please continue to like and put some hearts up for us and some comments and some questions. But uh, one thing I want to say, Auntie, that you said that was really good was that it, it's, the, it's a different look to the same Holy Ghost. And I think that that perspective can kind of take us a long way. That's very beautifully said. And in a great transition, even into our next question, um, I think the purpose of us having uh, so many different generations represented here on this panel is to kind of break down some of these, uh, these, these tough conversations that need to be had. And one of them, um, I think is this kind of battle, if you will, between the old and the new. There, Every time we have these co cross-generational conversation, there seems to be almost a little bit of tension, um, if you will, between what was and what is. Uh, we're talking about hand clapping, foot stomping, and, and tambourines versus this no shoes, guitar, style of worship. We're talking about, you know, formal dress codes versus in informal dress codes. We're talking about the traditional hoopers versus now the, the more modern style of, of preaching. Some people call it treaching. So they're preaching and they're teaching at the same time. So they may not get to a hoop, but they'll get to the altar call eventually. So um, this dynamic of kind of you know, what needs to stay, what needs to go. We can either have all of one and none of the other. Um, one, I, I wanna ask kind of a two part question in this, which is one, why is it that you think this kind of battle between the old and the new uh, exists? And two, is there a way or is there room for compromise? Can we have the best of both worlds? Can we have the best and the, and the amazing parts? Can we have the Azusa with the Stephen Furtick? 
Can we have can we have the Michael Todd um, um, and, and and the Bishop Wagner's? Can we can we merge the foot stomping uh, with the no shoes? Can can we bring those two together? Um, Brittany, I saw your hand up first. I'm going to go ahead and and go to you. Okay. So I think this is one of those questions that I and I know we keep expanding the panel. But I really think that this is one of those questions that I'd be interested to hear from someone who perhaps grew up in the church, but no longer attends for whatever reason. Because me, I come to church regardless. Um, I just come. And I like a little bit of hooping sometimes. And, you know, I want to be encouraged. I want to be hyped up. At the same time, I, I like to learn. Um, I want to be taught. And millennials are the most educated, or I should say the most degreed generation in history. So I think we appreciate as a whole more of a preaching teaching presentation. Um, so to answer your question, I don't think we throw away the old or the new. I think that we have to provide opportunities for diverse worship experiences. So millennials, we're not monolithic. There are some millennials who love hooping, some boomers, um, I'm sure prefer a lecture style presentation. Some folks are visual and, and they love PowerPoint presentations. So I think we have to find a way to incorporate all these experiences, whether that's adding a service, um, evolving a bit in our presentation so that we don't lose half the crowd. Um, and, and I, I wanna acknowledge that that will be difficult for a preacher who is naturally gifted in one of those areas or who came up in a time, um, let's say, of hooping where they've developed that skill. So I think change is hard in that regard, but I don't think that we can afford to leave behind um, people behind by merely preaching to one type of audience each week. Um, and so I think at the same time, it's important for preachers and pastors to stay within their anointing. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm. I can't hoop. I can mimic a hooper because I've grown up in church so long so I can get there and I can play hoop, but I'm not anointed or called in that area. Um, and so I think that if I hoop, it won't be authentic. And people are drawn to um, authentic experiences, authentic messages, authentic people. And so I think that this gives us an opportunity to survey the landscape and be able to create those diverse opportunities because we all have different gifts and we all have different anointings. And I, I just say something on the dress code real quick. So I personally don't have a problem dressing up. I grew up that way and I mostly dress up for my job pre-pandemic. But I think again, we have to look beyond ourselves and become more inclusive. And I don't think it's enough for us to say, come as you are or we don't care if you wear pants, or we don't care what you wear. I think for someone like me, and either, even people who are outside of the church, it's important to show me by doing. So I want to see the pastor or a deacon dress more casually on a Sunday. Uh, if a mother comes to church, or a member of the praise team, oh, Uncle Chuck's going to do it. If a mother or a church, or a member of the praise team comes in slacks, then I think we'll all feel more, more welcome to, to come in slacks. Uh, those ministers of order, they wear something besides black or white. Um, I think they have to lead the way for us all to feel comfortable enough to come into our churches more casually. Show me that it's okay. Uh, I told some people at my job a few weeks ago, good luck getting me to dress up for work ever again, because now everyone knows we have the data that I can do my job effectively in sweats for nine weeks. Um, and so in the church, we can worship more effectively. The pandemic has proven that we can worship in pajamas. And so I think, again, we have to create those diverse spaces for worship experiences. You know, some of those, you can wear your hosiery, you can wear your high heels and your hat, but also creating that space for people to wear jeans, people to wear slacks um, and be more welcoming. Um, we're going to go to uh, Sister Brantley and then Brandon Jones. Um, go ahead, Sister Brantley. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to go off of um, what she said. The teaching, the preaching, the hoop. Um, 
I never really understood what the hoop was for in all the years that I've been saved. I've been saved for 54 years. And I'm thinking that it's to make you feel good or something. Maybe that's what the hoop is. And because I'm sitting trying to think things out, you know, I'm going to jump up. It feels good. I'm going to clap and do all of that. But my mindset with my 12th grade education, I don't have any higher learning, which is sad to say, but it is what it is. I, I like you to, as our pastor, both of our pastors do, Pastor Krista, Pastor Sean Tyson, they will preach it on Sunday. And then they come back and teach it on Tuesday. They break it down for us. And I love it because in the preaching, you've got a mixture of some of all of that. So you can't really take the time, but they take that time. They'll preach it on Sunday. They'll teach it on Tuesday where we can now ask questions. You can't sit in church on Sunday and raise your hand and ask questions, but now you can ask the questions about what it was that you were preaching. The who has its place once you've gotten your preaching and your teaching something to hold on to, something that will get you through your trials and tribulations, then you can get a little hoop in there because in all honesty, that hoop is not going to give you what you need to get through your Monday through Friday. It, it just is not. It felt good and now it's gone. Now you need that substance, what it was that was taught. So that's where I am with that. She jumped over to the dress wear. Um, I am a casual person all day, every day long, and people don't really believe it because of what they think they see on Sunday. But I'm uncomfortable trying to walk in them high heels. The stockings are burning me up, itching, rubbing, especially in the summer. And so now I'm miserable. And now I'm not a real big shouter. But if I were to shout, I got to take my hat off and lay it somewhere because if I don't, it's about to fly. I'm trying to get up with these shoes that they're trying to kick off so that they can do what it is they do. Um, you've got on these uh, stiff suits or these confining suits and all of that. And I promise you, we have helped Dillard's department store in their sales when it comes to those types of clothing because our other brothers and sisters don't really spend that kind of money to wear those kinds of things. What they wear on Sundays, they're also able to wear during the week. What we wear on Sundays, now you gotta put it in your Sunday closet until your next Sunday comes. So that's actually a waste of money if you really think about all of that. But I'm for the more comfortable. I'm also, if I'm invite, inviting someone to church, they're asking me, what do I wear? What can I wear? And I said, you can wear whatever you want as long as you're pretty much covered up. And, you know, we don't want to see any body parts and those kinds of things. But now I can tell them they can wear whatever they want. And then they get there and they see me in these heels and stockings and suits and hats. And now they're uncomfortable. And they'll say, I thought you told me. And I'm letting them know it really is okay. But as Brittany says, we have to show them it's okay. We have to be all encompassing and we can't do that. And we're dressed over here and not whatever. And then here they come, they wanna feel included. So all I'm saying is, I think we need to take a look at it. We're pretty much all dressed down now and it's okay. As long as I said, we're modest in it and that we're covered. Hopefully we can go there and not go back. Brandon Jones. Wow, great points. Um, I'm going to try to hit a couple of different points and um, get out the way. But um, as in for surface, as in uh, as far as the service, um, what do I like to see? Um, I like to see something that has an impact. Now, uh, like I said, I'm in. I'm kind of. I've seen a couple of different generations of church. Uh, I've seen late '80s church, '90s church and you know our current our church of today and i don't have a problem with a hoop and a holler but i need a point behind it um i need i, I don't need you just to be hooping just to be hooping I, I need a point behind it and i don't have the problem with somebody teaching as long as they're just not trying to throw out big words at me and and trying to throw me in circles um i i guess i guess what i'm really saying is i need something 
that will stick with me. That's why I came to the house of the Lord on Sunday to get built up for the rest of the week and to carry me over until I can get another deposit or something that I can study on on my own time after I leave to take me on, on to the next point. Now, if the if it's if it's a good old hand clapping, foot stomping church, uh, it has its place. It has its time. It's needed. There, I'm I'm not going to throw away the hymns. I sometimes I wish we could sing more than hymns because they have meaning. There are power behind those words. But then again, also the guitar worship. If if some of the older saints would listen to some of these words and some of this guitar worship that we have great meaning behind the words it's just what impact is it really going to have and um okay that's that point <laughs> or as far as dress now um if you know me <laughs> if you really know me <laughs> like um uh, i'm not that excited to put on a three-piece suit on a sunday morning i'm really not I'm, I've never really been that that kind of guy that's never really been leader of. I follow the order of what's been established in my in in the house. Um, whatever my pastor has has put forth, this is the standard here. This is what I'm going to follow. Now I've been in I've been under different leaderships. I've been under leadership where I could just come to church, jeans and a button up every Sunday. Nobody's going to say anything. Brother Brandon, we love you. You connect with the youth like this. Then I've been in other places where, brother, you're gonna have to um, <laughs> you're gonna have to do something. You're gonna have to put a shirt and a tie on, you know, and a suit jacket before you even come three rows close to the pulpit, you know. So, um, but what what I'm saying is, I learned something. Um, I, I was um, I was with Dr. Scott for a while, Dr. Leonard Scott. Um, and he uh, he was training us about altar call, and he was saying all my ministers, I want all my ministers on the altar at altar call, and I wanted a collection of everybody because people go to who they can feel like they can identify with. It's a matter of comfortability, and so, you know, and he would tell me, Brandon, I just want you to be who you are because people identify with you, and people can look at you and say, I can identify with him and I can identify with who he is and I can come to him and feel comfortable. The church needs to not to make, make people feel comfortable in sin. I, I want to be clear, but we need to feel like we're here with open arms and you can come in as you are, but then get have a moment with God and be changed. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that people need to stay, I'm not excusing people need to be baby saints forever. We need to change. We need to evolve. Um, I've had to change and evolve even in when I first came to Christ, you know, to now, now I, you know, I have a few suits <laughs> and, you know, now I can put a few different suits on, but, you know, I still maintain who, who I am. I'm not changing who, who I am as a person but God has put a change in me. And so we, we need to kind of reevaluate and it does start from the top. Go ahead, Dr. Key. I, I feel Dr. Key is bubbling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there were so many great points. I think at the end of the day, what it boils down to is culture. Culture. And I think that one of the things that, that makes it so difficult for um, transgenerational conversation is that each generation is wedded to their culture. And cultures evolve, they change. <laughs> you know, I, I personally, you know, don't believe that hooping is an anointing. I think hooping is culture. You know, I think the loudness of our preaching is culture. You know, you can only, you'll only do what you've seen done, you know, and we never ask why they did it. And they probably do it because they've seen that done and they never ask why they did it. So it's a matter of really teasing out what actually is necessary, what actually is viable versus what actually is culture. Because if, you know, when you're talking about preaching, when you're talking about uh, services, when you're talking about dress, you know, the, the Bible, you know, has its words about it. You know, the only thing I see about dressing the Bible is about being modest. Well, what does modest look like? 
who said that wearing a three-piece suit is modest because some of my professional friends are afraid to come to church because of the sequins on some of the women's dresses. They don't see it as modest. They don't see it as modest. They don't see the color as modest. They don't see that the, the size of the hat as modest. It is a distraction to them. But because we are churched, we don't see it as a distraction. It is part of the culture that we are wedded to. So what we need to do is learn how to have conversations that allow us to tease out culture so that we can be relevant in every generation because something is going to change from generation to generation to generation. And if we're wedded to culture, we'll almost, almost swear that the type of church that this generation has now is not church. And this generation will almost swear that the type of church our forefathers had was not church, you know, and it's all around culture. So, you know, that's what I'm, that, that's, that's what I'm thinking. And, and I think that gets in the way of our conversations. Excellent points. Excellent points. Yes, Elder Baldwin. I'm growing from this conversation and uh, I appreciate the impact of, of the conversations. And we are wedded to our cultures and we are like our fathers and our mothers who went before us who presented this is what church looks like and the brothers in our church we followed our pastor who was one of the cleanest gq guys Ever. But he also used that piece to say, when we want a job, how to present yourself. Going back to what you're saying, uh, Dr. Key, what was the purpose behind it? He was one of the most humblest men you'd ever want to meet. He didn't talk about, he looked the part, but he had the humility to, to be touched. And because of that delivery, it wasn't his preaching that won me over. It was when I was reading his electric meter and I was, he remembered me being my best friend. And he sat there and talked to me about heaven and about the God that I was missing out on. And I agree with you, we got to do this thing differently because the younger people said how we did it, they're not, they're, they're not buying that. It's not relevant to them. So I think the problem that's set before us, how do we bring us all together and say, I'm okay, you're okay. Because God made us all okay. And not, and not to offend and to do some sense making out of what we're calling church. Um, because what Lynn is saying, what we have made a portrait of holiness Our kids are saying we've got cubic zirconia. It's not real. It's tainted. But we know God is real and He didn't crack under pressure. And that's the piece um, in the church service. I think it has to be relative. Um, I'm, I'm a ghetto Christian, I need some beef. I, I, you know, I, I don't have a problem with you coming in bare feet with a, a guitar, wash your feet, sing about Jesus, make it relative to me, give me a little harmony every now and then, sway just a minute, give me a beat. And my kids had to make me appreciate some of the new artists of today because I came up with the Clark sisters. I came up with uh, Milton Bronson. The church of the 80s. 
that cared is over. But now I've got a, a better appreciation for Jonathan McReynolds. I don't know if he'll make me speak in tongues all the time. You know, Tamla Man gets me to, you know, she takes me to the king. But I think it's all of those things that we have to be able to, there comes a time when we as the baby boomers have a need to be taught. And I think that's where we are. And I think in one of your questions that you put on the paper, when you get to this section, I think when I, we see our time pass, we don't know how to say, I want you younger people to lead me now. Teach me some things. Um, this is the first time I have hooked in on Facebook for myself. I look at my wife, my kids, but I'm not on Facebook. But I think Dr. Key, Brandon, Brittany, if you continue to, to work with us and Ariana and help us say, we don't want to get rid of you but we want to walk with you because we need what you got and I need what you got, you know? Yeah, because that's a, that's an excellent, excellent point. I think that um, that's really at the heart of what we're trying to do here. And I appreciate that perspective because all across the board, what it sounds like from each of you is not that we want to get rid of one or the other, but we just want to find out what's impactful, what's going to help, what's going to change my life. And I think that heart posture that uh, Elder Baldwin just mentioned is going to be what helps us transition. Um, that posture of you teach me, you help me, you don't throw this away or throw that away, but let's just figure out together what works best. I think this is an excellent place to transition. And Pastor Hart, I'm going to ask you this question then. Having that kind of mindset and that perspective, um, I, um, I know that last time we had a discussion, um, some of the older saints mentioned not wanting to feel obsolete, um, not wanting to feel left out or like what they have is no longer relevant. So can you speak to now having this perspective of you teach me and I teach you why is a multi-generational church so important uh, with this perspective of what we had back then is relevant, what we have now is relevant. We just need to figure out what works the best. Why is a multi-generational church important? Pastor Harden. I think that a multi-generational church is very important because it lends itself to decades of information, knowledge, experience and it there's a bridge where you don't miss a link it's like a bicycle chain and a bicycle chain needs all the links to patch themselves together to make the gear roll and so if we only have links on this end and links on this end then there's nothing in the middle then you can't move and so it's the same way with the church if you have only those with a mindset and we're going to say the old mindset and they don't allow the new mindset to integrate with them. They're missing out on the technology. Look at the Zoom that we're doing and the Facebook. That's beneficial. And when you can link my experience with the technology of my nieces and some of those young folks in the church, and they can show me what's available, and I can say, hey, take this what I've learned and put that with what you've learned, and let's make something happen. It's very important that it's multi-generational because it keeps the church alive. The church will be alive as long as there's a replacement to come in. I think one of the places of resentment is that we don't want to be replaced. We'll see someone come in and we are fearful that they're going to take our place. It's seen in something as simple as, if you all notice in most of your churches, the same people sit in the same seat every Sunday. And so if someone comes and sits in that seat, they come in the door and see someone and there's an attitude already because someone has taken my place. 
And therein is where I believe that the tension rises in that the young people are going to take my place because their worship might get a little bit more excitement from the crowd. And so once you focus on God and that it's all about God, then you can accept what God brings to the table. Because I say, as Jesus told his disciples, they say, Master, we saw two over there in your name. Jesus said, if they're not against us, then they're for us. And so that's what we must understand. And, and I think that it's important to keep the church alive, to have several decades tying together, because that's where we'll have strength. We'll have the strength of every decade tied together to make one. I just want to jump in here and piggyback off of, of Pastor Bruce. I, I agree that it's very important for churches to be multi-generational. Um, no generation has it all. And I'll go a little bit biblical for a little bit. Um, Jesus said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And so even before then, we can go back to the very beginning of the Old Testament and find these multi-generational mandates from God's covenant with Abraham. Um, but it wasn't just for Abraham, it was for his descendants, mm -hmm. generational. And in Psalms, we are told that God issued laws to Israel and, and to their children to tell the, the next generation about the wonderful works of God. Why? So that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God and keep his commandments. And so there are several instances of generational commands that God gives through the scriptures. And so we have to ask ourselves, how did they accomplish this? Through communication and relationship. So we see that in the Bible, it was a familial relationship. And it was a relationship that was so strong, so full of trust. I trust that what you are telling me is true because we have a relationship. I can digest what you are telling me because we have relationship and you know how to communicate with me. I can then pass on what you have told me about God, because again, we have relationship. So not only do I know it because you told me, but my proximity to you, again, because of our relationship, allows me to experience your God for myself. So I think we have to extrapolate those principles and practices into our own church environments, establish relationships that are so solid that they become familial. I'd like to jump in. Um, I heard the obsolete come in there before we went into the generational. Um, the obsolete, I think that we first must remember that what we do is not who we are. And I think a lot of times we get stuck doing something now you encompass that and you feel like this is who you are. So now when it's time for you to retire or you get sick and you can't do what you've been used to doing or we have others coming up behind that are also called in that same field but there's only one position and I'll use my husband who was and is a drummer. We had one drummer at the church and he played, but as you have the others coming up behind, you know, he played for years from the age of maybe 12 or 13, all the way up. So when you have others coming up that also want to play, you can't just hog up that drum set saying, this is what I do. And then when someone else needs to play, um, now you're feeling obsolete. No, it can't happen that way. And I thank God that he was not like that. He took them under his wings. He taught them the correct methods of doing what needs to be done. And then I'll use me, a choir member, an altar evangelist, uh, a juice governor, a usher, and uh, armor bearer. So when I moved from one, I had something else to do. So I never felt obsolete. So I think that you just have to have something else to do. We have all kinds of things in church to do, but we get stuck in what it was we felt like was ours. And I got tickled when he talked about the seating because I'm an usher too. And when the people come in and they look and they see that seat in there, we've had people actually turn around and leave 
because they were upset because they couldn't sit where they wanted to sit. So all of this is going on, but we have to remember um, when we get into this, I'll do the scripture, the Acts 2.17, where it talks about um, the young men have visions and the old men dream dreams. All of that has to come together in your generational uh, coming together because I can probably give you a run for your money. If y'all want to run around church 10 times, I'm going to hang. I can do that. Now, if you're going into the 20 times around, I'm probably going to have to bow out at maybe 15. So now the young men and the young women have to jump in and do that because I now got the wisdom and the knowledge that I can't do that anymore. So I'm not going to hurt myself. So we've got to bring it all together and you've got to be confident enough and who you are and who God called you to be and your talents. And then you have to be confident enough to give the younger people coming up what you have, but you also have to be confident enough to receive what they have to give to you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, Dr. Key, did you want to say anything? I know you have to log off uh, really quickly. Yeah, I, I just wanted to know what a juice governor was. I never heard that in my life. <laughs> But thank you. Um, I got the answer about that. But just to that point, you know, I find it interesting that we would have a title called Juice Governor. And I think one of the differences between, um, you know, past generations and this current generation is that we don't feel like all of our service has to be in church. Or that our calling requires us to be within the four walls of a building. You know, um, I believe that I can, you know, start a nonprofit and that be a ministry or I can go and, you know, teach in the university and that be a ministry, you know, those types of things. So I think, you know, we, we need to take, uh, take a look at that. Um, I think that's one of the differences as well. But um, one, of, uh, one of the things I said last time was validation. That's going to be important. We can't say that what past generations have done was no good. That is just unacceptable. That is unacceptable because you would not be where, we would not be where we are today if they hadn't done it. <laughs> you know, but as uh, uh, Pastor Baldwin was was saying, um, you teach me, I teach you. This is an exchange back and forth, you know, and we can learn from one another. I don't know about anybody else, but I feel so refreshed just hearing like the different voices of the different generations come together and be able to express each other's point of view. Like it feels really, really healthy from a psychologist's standpoint. <laughs> so I'm enjoying it. But I have to jump off. Um, I love you guys. Thank you guys for listening. And I hope we can do this again. All right. Amen. We love you, Dr. Keith. Thank you so much for joining yes, thank us. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, actually, as we're looking at it, we're actually running out of, uh, of time for this discussion. But um, those of you that have joined us live on Facebook, we just want to say thank you uh, for this opportunity. And I will say this um, before we go ahead. And I'm going to actually ask Pastor Harden to close us out in a word of prayer. But um, I think that some of the things that can be gained from this conversation, uh, one, recognizing that a multi-generational church is necessary. Um, our older generation, you are necessary. Millennials, you are necessary. Young people, you are necessary. All of us are needed in this body uh, to help the church function and, and, and go where, we, where it is that we need to go. I love the, the scripture that actually uh, Brittany had pointed out about um, in the last days, I would pour my spirit. And it says your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Well, vision, if you look at what a vision is, it is the power of sight, but a dream is a plan right? So we have the sight, we have the power of sight, but we need the older generation because you know where we need to go. Um, you know where it is that we've been. Uh, we need you to pour into us. Millennials, we need your footwork. We need your innovation. We need your creativity. Young people, we need you to carry the mantle when our time is over. Um, our millenn the millennials, our generation is starting to come up as some of our fathers are going on to glory. Our generation is starting to have to take on those higher roles. So we need to know where to go. Um, and, and we can only do that um, by getting wisdom from our fathers and from our mothers that are still here. So um, I just want to say thank you all so much for joining in on this conversation. I think it's necessary. I agree with Dr. Key that it is healthy. 
Um, it is important for us to have these conversations to see where we're falling short, but also points where we can grow. We don't wanna just talk about uh, what's wrong, but I think that uh, after this discussion, we can see some points where we can grow. Maybe in your church, you'll be encouraged to sit down the members of your church and, and have these conversations more frequently so we can figure out how, can we, how we can be um, a better unit uh, for the body of Christ. I do know that uh, for those of you who are part of Calvary, uh, this is your Bible study night. We have bombarded your Bible study again, uh, but we do hope that you have enjoyed these panel discussions. Um, if you are still uh, needing to give, uh, our cash app is MTC Youngstown uh, with a dollar sign in front, MTC Youngstown. And you can also give by PayPal and Givelify, um, which can be accessed at www.calvaryforyou.org. Uh, please continue to follow the Mount Calvary page. Um, we also continue to give honor to our Bishop and First Lady for allowing us to have uh, this time, this platform, and this moment. And again, I thank each and every one of our panelists this evening for joining us uh, and for blessing uh, our screens. Um, Pastor Harden, can you please close us out in a word of prayer? We shall. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you now for this time of sharing. We thank you for our ears to hear, our hearts to love, and our minds to relieve and conceive what has been said. We thank you now because you've given voice to your people that we may come together, learn, and grow. We pray, God, that we will use the things that we have gathered and garnered to go forth and make your kingdom better. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening and we will see you next Tuesday for Bible study. God bless you. Have a great evening. God bless you. God bless you.